Buenos dias, buenos nachos. Hello, hello, hello. My name is Daniel Garcia Ordaz, and we are live, y'all. We're talking here tonight uh, about uh, genealogy, and uh, we're, we're going to focus uh, with an uh, expert on Mexican genealogy, Moises Garza. He's an author of many, many, many books. Uh, he also has a conference coming up. Uh, Moises Garza is going to talk to us about genealogy focused on the Rio Grande Valley, focused on Mexico and some of the regions near us that, uh, you know, uh, for where most of our ancestors, at least on maybe let's one one side or other of our family are from. Um, and uh, there's also a conference we'll be talking a little bit about. And uh, that's coming up in, in September. It's called the We Are Cousins Genealogy Conference. We'll talk some more about it, the We Are Cousins Genealogy Conference. It's a three-day conference, uh, September 23rd, 24th, 25th. And it'll be live also, I should say, uh, it'll be available, accessible, uh, as a recorded situation with uh, 24 speakers. And uh, it's going to be a three-day conference coming up uh, called the We Are Cousins uh, Genealogy Conference. So uh, without further ado, I want to welcome, welcome, welcome our speaker tonight. Our guest tonight is Moises Garza. Bienvenido, Moises. Uh, thank you, Daniel, for inviting me to, or for this interview. Y yeah, um, so, um, Folks, we want to we want to definitely take some questions and uh, English and Spanish or whatever. Um, if Tim Smith, if you're watching, you know we're we're gonna point at the map and everything. You know, make you proud. I think we know we know where we're from, Tim Smith. So, <laughs> so um, just real quick for myself, uh, Moises. I know. Well, we we I think we met maybe about a year uh, about a year ago uh, officially at the uh, Region One an event for for authors. And uh, it was neat to, to get to know you a little bit. And uh, my, I know my, my my dad's from Jalisco. So people ask me, well, tú eres Garcia, you know, like, ah, conoces lo de Rio Grande City, Garcia's Bill or whatever. So no, no, my cousins are in, in Arizona and California and Jalisco uh, for the most part on my dad's side. Now my mom's side, definitely what, what you're going to talk about tonight, which is uh, definitely that connection from uh, the Regio Montanos. I mean, basically... Um, so I'm very excited, you know, to 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 hear about everything you've got going on. Uh, let me just get, go to, back to the future real quick. So we're talking genealogy, y'all, with Moises Garza, and he has a lot of books. Or he has a conference coming up on genealogy that we're going to be talking about. Um, so Moises Garza is here tonight taking your questions and comments. So please send us your questions and comments. So Moises, uh, basically, how did you get started with this whole genealogy thing? Well, my journey started back in 1998. As I told you earlier, um, I used to be a migrant worker. We used to go up north uh, to near the Texas Panhandle, near the Lubbock area in a small town called uh, Brownfield, Texas, population of only 10,000. Well, if you work in the fields, like I know many of us have, uh, you know those surcos are almost a mile long and a mile back. So. We were younger and my dad to help us pass the time a little bit faster, he would tell a story after story about his own uh, ancestors. And not ancestors, but more his uh, maternal grandparents. Later on, I uh, found out that he actually lived with them for about 10 years when he was a little kid. And I just love those stories. And there's something con nosotros mexicanos, like our storytelling, their tales taller than life that you're like, ah, that's not true. You know, you, you take back like, no, this, that's not true. That couldn't happen or that can't happen. But that's just a way of storytelling that they grab your attention and you're immediately in a different world, how descriptive their platicas were. Yeah. And, um, and so you, uh, so you, I guess, among your brothers and sisters, your siblings, you're, you're the one that kind of like grabbed onto some of those stories? Basically, yes. And uh, each family has basically one. One person gets interested in each family. And they're usually the story uh, keepers, the genealogy keepers, or the genealogists in the family. And since he talked a lot about his grandparents, one day I asked him, hey, Dad, well, who are your great-grandparents? And he just paused, and he's like, actually, I don't know. Luckily, my grandmother was still alive. And when we came back, in Rome, uh, she was living in Roma, Texas at the time. We went to her house, and she handed my dad a little piece of paper, and she said, Ten para que nunca se te olvide de donde venemos. And that little paper had the four names of her grandparents. But 
those names were was what what I later needed to be able to trace that family back to the 1500s. Nice. Turns, out, turns out that she's a Marroquin and the Marroquin, um, the first Marroquin in Nuevo Leon that we can track was actually married to a great granddaughter of Diego de Montemayor, who's the founder of Monterrey. So that's a link to that part of Monterrey. And basically that's how I got started. Yeah. Um... And I know we're gonna, you know, focus on, uh, uh, you know, the Monterrey area, like that sort of uh, area, también. So that's great. And I know uh, you know, a lot of us are definitely, definitely have roots there uh, in that area, if not in the actual city. So Reynosa is about more than 200 years old, and Monterrey is more than 400 years old. Is that right, más o menos? Correct. Correct. Okay. Monterrey was founded, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, in uh, 1596. Um, it was the third attempt to found the city, but it was a successful one. That's why we give credit to Diego de Montemayor and not Luis de Carvajal or uh, Alberto El Canto. And then uh, about two, over 200 and some years later, we have Las Vías del Norte. And Las Vías del Norte was a response uh, to the French, uh, not invasion, but the French settlement that was done in La Bahía del Espíritu Santo. Uh, just past uh, uh, Corpus Christi. But another reason I think Las Vías del Norte were founded was because the government or the Spanish government wanted a way to tax the people. It wasn't, uh, it was to settle and to, I guess, increase more revenue. But that's something a lot of historians don't talk about. Um, and Las Vías del Norte, just for those of you that do not know what they are, Las Vías del Norte, when I say Las Vías del Norte, I'm referring to Laredo, Texas. Arrevia, which is present-day Guerrero, Tamaulipas. Uh, Ciudad Mier, Camargo, and Reynosa. And Las Vías del Norte do not include Matamoros because Matamoros was founded in 1784, which is about 34 years later than these other vías. Okay. And a lot of our ancestors came with Jose Escandón to settle this area. And this is the beginning to South Texas as we know it. And when I say Las Vías del Norte, guess what? The jurisdiction wasn't just out of the Rio Grande River. The jurisdiction for Mier went all the way to San Diego, Texas. The jurisdiction for Camargo uh, includes what's now Star County. Reynosa, it's what uh, Hidalgo County is right now. And then Matamoros, well, present day Cameron County. They used to control all the government affairs all the way to the Texas independence in 1880, uh, 1848. Right, up, up until the, uh, the U.S.-Mexico War, basically. Basically. As, as the, so uh, why do, why you know, I have a uh, deal that, you know, passed away recently. He, he was our genealogy guy in our family. And, uh, uh, you know, what is it that makes us, at a certain age, whether you're young or older, I mean, that, that makes people you think interested in genealogy. Basically what I've seen and from experience, um, me and other people are, are, I'm like the exception because I started very young and I'm not the only one, there's other young people out there, but the majority of uh, people that get interested in finding or researching these roots, it's when their last uh, parent passes away basically. That's a big motivator, uh, usually because guess what? We think, oh, our parents are gonna be around forever. We can ask them these questions whenever we want. Eventually they pass away and we never ask the questions. So that's yeah. basically what a lot of people, motivates a lot of people. And another thing, uh, don't wait until your parents have passed away. Don't wait until your abuelita or abuelito have passed away start asking those questions right now, and use your cell phone. Just hit record, find a, an audio recorder, and just put it there, have a conversation with them. And don't pressure them. They'll, they're gonna love you for it because they wanna tell somebody their stories or their life story. And you're the only one that can record it for them. Because once they're gone, that's it. It's gonna be lost forever. Yeah, it's a good point. And right now with COVID, of course, I mean, we're limited and, and you know, maybe not able to uh, be, in, uh, you know, visiting abuelitos or tias right now or that sort of thing but but you can zoom we've been zooming uh with a family you know on sundays with uh, my mom my tias and and uh and tios and others you know 
but um, and primos. But I mean, you can zoom like one on one just with you and your abuelita or something like that, and you can record that as well. And so you have a video, and you're still distancing, and but you have that memory. So that's a great, uh, great point. And and you know how they say a picture it's worth a thousand uh, words. Imagine a video that you do. And guess what? Zoom, zoom is so easy that anybody could uh, use it. It doesn't matter the age because basically you send them a link. They down. They just click the link. It opens it up for them. It's very easy to record. Yeah. So you started uh, around 1988, muscle menos. You said. Uh, how has you know genealogy research? How was it sort of then at the beginning, and and how has it changed with the World Wide Web? Uh, when I started genealogy back in 1998, basically I didn't know anything. It was just curiosity. I asked my dad, and then. I tried to do a family tree by myself using a pencil and paper, which is like, it's good to start with, but it's the wrong way to start it. Now I tell people use a form, an official like six generation chart form. And once you get tired of those, actually invest and buy software. And there's software that's uh, free out there uh, that you don't even have to spend a penny uh, to help you keep track of your family tree. And now, um, back in 1998, it was very hard. The internet, it's not what it is nowadays. Uh, there were very few records online. And then from 1998 to 2010, 2011, it was hard to actually do genealogy, especially for us uh, that have Mexican ancestry. But then something happened in 2010, 2011 that changed everything for us. Uh, Family Search published the Mexican civil registration records for Mexico, basically for all of Mexico, and that covers 1860 through the 1930s, some towns all the way to 2002. So now that opened a gateway for us to be able to find, for example, my abuelito's birth certificate. And guess what? His birth certificate mentioned his parents and he mentioned his abuelitos. And then prior to 1860, Family Search has the Mexican Catholic uh, church records. And you may say, hey, Moises, my family is not Catholic. It's like they're not useful to me. And guess what? I was I grew up thinking like that because I was not raised Catholic. But guess what? I guarantee you all your ancestors, if they were from Mexico, they were Catholic. Uh, if you're not Catholic right now, that probably just happened in the last 50, 60 years that your family uh, chose to practice another religion. But the records are there, and the Catholic Church records, they also have the names of the abuelitos in many of the recent documents, the names of the parents in all those records, also when they got married. So now it's very easy for us just to go online without leaving your home because of, well, nowadays with COVID, it's a real good reason not to leave. But you could do everything from your home. You don't have to go through archives. I do recommend once we we're able to go outside and visit archives. Yeah, visit archives because you're gonna get access to other records that are not online. But it's very easy for us to do our genealogy nowadays. Right. I mean, I know that uh, you know, maybe someone out there who who does not. We're gonna definitely focus on Mexican ancestry tonight. But I know some people out there who don't have you know, let's say Mexican ancestry. Uh, you're you're probably a little bit lucky because you have. <laughs> access to American records, uh, the Mayflower or whatever, you know, and so, uh, and European records, of course, from hundreds of years ago. So, uh, so we're gonna you, focus on, on, uh, on us for a little bit. <laughs> but you know, Daniel, it's, it's easier for us to do research than uh, somebody of Anglo descent, because in the US, the females lose their identity. They lose their uh, last name and the Mexican records know they kept their last name and not just their paternal last name but their maternal last name too right so american research is easy to research the males but not the females now uh, for us of uh, mexican descent we're able to research them all absolutely and males yeah no that's a great point and uh my my paycheck says garcia i'm mr garcia to my students uh, but I use my mother's name uh, as a creative person, you know, to honor her in the in the Hispanic tradition, right? Which uh, 
uh, also lets my kids know a little bit more about them than, you know, who they are, where we're from, uh, because yes, because upon marriage, plus the, the females lose their maiden name. Well, uh, you're right though. The, uh, the Mexican records definitely, they help a lot with that. Este, so talk to me, man. Oye, somos primos o qué, Moises? Si sí, somos primos. <laughs> and you know why? When did? From experience and doing research, I found out that if one of your ancestors is from this area, and when I say this area, I'm talking about any anybody below San Antonio, all the way to the Monterrey area, and all the way to Saltillo, Coahuila, those, uh, Coahuila, Nuevo León, Tamaulipas, and basically Texas. If you go five to eight generations back, we're all related. Yeah. So if you if you don't want to find out that you're related to your wife, don't do her genealogy. Just just focus on yours. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So right, porque por ahí tan por ahí entre entre este inter inter mingling some somewhat. And so we're talking about, of course, cities, but also many many ranchos as well. Uh, what what does a Catholic baptism record have that maybe a birth certificate in Mexico does maybe not have, or vice versa? Uh, basically, I like civil registration records better, but unfortunately, civil registration records only from 1860 to 1930, uh, because they have the parents and then they have the grandparents. Catholic church records, if you go back to the 1550s, it's only the name of the child and the name of the parents. As we start getting to the 1800s on um, Catholic records, you start seeing the name of the, the uh, I'm sorry, the names of the parents and also the grandparents. But the Catholic Church, uh, well, at least the locations that I've researched, uh, the further back you go, they don't include the parents. But I also love Catholic Church records because they go back all the way to the 1500s in uh, Mexico, to Mexico City, where basically uh, um, the colonization started. Right. Um, and so we're talking mainly about roots, having roots in Spain, Portugal. W would those be the two main countries of, of ancestry or? Uh... Uh, you would be surprised. If you look at, at uh, the DNA of a Chinese person, you're, if you use a chromosome painter, it's only one color. Same thing if you grab uh, somebody has an Anglo ancestry, more than likely it's one big color. Now, when you see a Hispanic or a Mexicano, you see a whole rainbow. Uh, we have all types of ethnicities. We have a uh, Spanish. You see Skittles. We got everything. We got everything. And my dad even has some British. And I'm like, how the heck? I haven't found any British in my uh, paper family tree. But on the DNA family tree, there's a British in that. And also something that a lot of people try and deny for our area. Uh, we have a lot of uh, African-American DNA in us. And the Native American, nobody denies it. We have it. And sometimes I get criticized. Hey, we says, why do you only post records about Spanish uh, people? And like, because they're the ones that left us the records. If I would be finding records about my Native American ancestry, guess what? I would be, I would love to post them, you know? Proudly, right. Um, unfortunately, we only find our ancestors that they were uh, Native American because it says they're Indio or India, and that's it. Sometimes they don't even have a last name, but we know, hey, that's where my uh, Native American DNA comes from. Right, I've seen just a few of my family records, just very few that might say, uh, they might say uh, Mestiza, Mestizo, I mean, maybe like two or three that I've seen, uh, and, uh, and they'll go out of their way and say that they're light skinned or, or that sort of thing. But, but no, you're right. I mean, I'm very proud of my Native American ancestry as well, but, but yeah, there's no written records. And, and so it's hard to, you know, substantiate that, but yeah, my, my DNA for and on ancestry, I mean, yeah, we got, uh, uh, we got, you know, we got Jewish blood, we got, uh, Irish, a little bit of Irish, a little bit of British, um, you know, a little bit of a uh, poquito de todo French and, and Italian y todo. You know, we're we're a mixture because the Spanish, um, even some people say, well, it didn't happen in Mexico. Some Spanish captains like uh, did do genocide in South America, but unfortunately for us, and a lot of people don't give credit to Hernan Cortez because he was a conqueror, right? Um, 
you got to give credit to that guy because he didn't do genocide like other captains did in South America. Basically, the concept was, you know, bring them, bring Native Americans into the fold. Of course, disease, you can't control that. It's right, like, just like COVID, we can't control it right now. Even if the Spaniards wanted to control diseases, there was no way of them doing it. So, of course, disease did cause genocide, but it was not intentional. Like a lot of people argue and get um, um, emotional about it. Right. I mean, it helps to it helps to sell sell books, and and it helps to have that. It's easy to have that attitude, and I understand the anger sometimes and the frustration. Um, just like um, you know, if you're an African American, you're going to find eventually uh, if you, if you you know have some some luck because of uh, slave records, of course, were also not kept very well. But I mean, if you have some luck, you're going to find some ancestry. Uh, information and you're going to find a white ancestor in, in your black you know african american slave uh, experience and it's not you know something necessarily you're going to want to celebrate or whatever but i mean it is you know it is what it is and and same with with cortez it's easy to you know tear down statues and who knows and, and all that but um uh there's you know we're, we're we're judging someone in 2020 standards from from the 1500s and that you know and it's again, it's easy to politicize things, but at the end of the day, we have the the Mexican blood, we have uh, the the European blood, and also, like you mentioned, the African you know roots as well. <clears throat> este, there's a question. I'm not sure I understand it. I'll just read it word for word. How would it work with a person that was registered with the name of his birth mother's parents? Well. Those are kind of difficult, but if he was registered with a mother's last name, well, all you have to do is search in the civil registration with her last name. And it's a good thing to do as a genealogist. If you can't find them with a paternal last name, you do the maternal. But then there's going to be cases where you're not going to be able to find any records. And I, I like to give this example. My grandfather, my mom, she's a Tanguma, but in reality, she should have been a Zamora. If I look at my grandfather's uh, death record, it says that Toribio Tanguma was his father. Well, guess what? Toribio Tanguma was his uncle, but he raised him. Hmm. So you're going to find those things. If it wouldn't be because of uh, that this happened recently in 19, 1914, 1911, that time period, the family still had recollections of uh, who was his real father because eventually in the 18 i'm sorry 1950s uh he was recognized by his father and turns out that he had like 16 half brothers and sisters so that's something that we were able to record and now preserve right now if it came down through family lore that he got registered by the mother's uh, uh paternal last name will search for him with that paternal last name Unfortunately, if the document does not say who his father was, uh, you're out of luck unless the family knows. And in that case, contact all your all the old, older living relatives that you have right now, because somebody might have heard that story, and they right. may know who the parent is or the father. Now, um, it seems like because we're stuck at home and all that, um, uh, you know, one of the new hobbies it seems to be, you know, a lot of people are getting their DNA checked and then also going on the ancestry sites what are two or three sites that uh, you you can recommend and maybe a few that, that maybe we should stay away from i don't know um well i'm going to talk about first i'm going to talk about the uh, websites where you can find records okay and i'm going to do a promotion right here sure I, sure of course, of course i highly recommend if you have ancestors from south texas and northeastern mexico go to we are cousins that info that's my personal blog where i share uh, records about my own ancestors and i show that so you could know the possibilities or the possibilities if i hey moises can find those records i'm i should be able to find them too it's just a mentality shift and also i provide a lot of uh, resources not that i make but uh, that i find out there to make more people aware of them. And then of course, Family Search. Family Search has it's a record repository heaven or a gold mine there. 
you're going to be able to find records for your ancestors there. Also, Ancestry.com, I only recommend them for the, their family, I'm sorry, their civil registration records. Family Search has them for free, but the difference is that Ancestry has indexed them. So instead of going microfilm by microfilm and image by image, you could just go to Ancestry and type in what you're looking for and you'll find out if it's available or not. Another thing, if you can't find your ancestors, it doesn't mean that there's no records about them. It just means that those records haven't been indexed yet. And, <clears throat> and I know because uh, even on the civil registration, I was doing Ciudad Mier the other day. Well, guess what? On the matrimonials, there's a uh, span of 20 years that hasn't been indexed yet. So guess what? All those couples, if your ancestors is one of those couples, well, you're not going to find them. You, in that case, you're going to have to go image by image. And um, DNA-wise, I've tested with three companies, Family Tree DNA, Ancestry DNA, and 23andMe. Mm -hmm. And each one has a different purpose. If you're an adoptee and you're looking for your ancestors, I recommend test on all of them. And also 23, especially on 23andMe, because it has a chromosome browser, and it'll tell you the ethnicities or you don't paint ethnicities where your family, uh, where your particular ancestry. That way, you it'll give you an idea if you're Anglo or Hispanic or more Native American, and then you start comparing with other uh, people. Now, family tree DNA. That's if you want to test your um, empty DNA, which is the maternal DNA, or the Y DNA, which is the paternal DNA. Those are very narrow um, tests, but they go thousands of years back. They also have the family finder one, which is to look for uh, distant cousins. And then Ancestry DNA, if your pure goal is uh, finding family, I recommend Ancestry DNA because a lot of people there have trees, public trees, and you could interact with them. Another thing, you got to be careful. If you send messages, don't expect that they're going to respond to you. A lot of people, they just wanted to know their ethnicity and they're not interested in DNA, uh, in genealogy. But if you message somebody that's interested in genealogy in particular, in a particular family, they will respond to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the uh, the mitochondrial DNA, um, that that's the maternal line, the Y DNA, and that's why it goes back to our ancestral Eves almost uh, way back in the way back to the beginning, right? <laughs> Correct. Uh, my mother's uh, maternal DNA, it's, uh, it's a D2, which is Native American. And I've been able to trace her line back all the way back to Zacatecas uh, in the late 1680s. Uh, but that's it. I don't know anything else. And even if you do research, okay, what tribes were in that town, um, they're not going to be accurate because the Spanish were were already colonizing, uh, colonized there. So they might have moved tribes around or the tribes might have just moved to avoid the Spaniards. Mm -hmm. este, there's a question, let's see. Um, uh, Kelly Sorensen, uh, hi everybody for joining us. Thanks so much for your questions and comments. Uh, Kelly Sorensen is asking, Ancestry seems to put my cousins from Mexico more distant than they should be on DNA. I would upload the DNA to other sites as well. Uh, Moises, uh, how is my is my heritage the uh, you know I guess the website my heritage with with documents twenty three to me is is good. Uh, is there a site called my heritage that you want to talk about? Uh, yes, but unfortunately, I've I used to use my heritage back in the two thousand tens two thousand eleven, but lately I haven't used it, so I wouldn't feel comfortable giving um, any advice on it. I know I uploaded my uh, DNA, but only the free version, and I didn't find it really useful. But this was two years ago. I haven't been there in the last two years. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't feel comfortable, you know, putting somebody down or giving credit to something that I haven't really tested. Right. Have you uh, heard of, uh, uh, witnessed, or heard of uh, surprises in, in DNA searches? <laughs> like, well, wait a minute, I have this extra cousin uh, that Theo never told us about <laughs> or whatever. You know, I, I can't give specifics on that because uh, due to privacy, but sure. that, that's one of the biggest ones. Like, hey, Moises, I got a surprise, or my, my brother got a surprise that he's not really 
<clears throat> my dad's child or right. my mom's child. So you do find those types of surprises. So when I tell people, if you're going to test your DNA, prepare yourself because you don't know if your father or your mother is really your, who they are. But uh, like I tell people, it doesn't matter what you get. If they raise you, they're your parents. Absolutely. You know, because uh, that's what you're going to pass down to your children, what you learn from the, per the people that raised you, not from your, of course, you give your chromosomes to your children, but not how they are or, or what you teach them. Right. No, that's a valid point. Um, well, uh, I'm going to remove myself from the screen for a moment, and I'm going to ask you to uh, to talk about your Monterrey series a little bit, or, or uh, your book, rather. <clears throat> okay. Um, earlier, earlier on, Daniel told me if I could grab some books uh, to show around. Basically, I'm going to start with a book. Uh, and this is the Monterrey, the first families, uh, the funny families of her descendants. Basically, this book is a. Uh, it's about the uh, first 12 families to get to Monterrey where almost all of us are descendants from because these families intermarried, uh, their children intermarried with each other. And also as new arrivals were getting there, they were marrying into these families. And Monterrey, it's basically the cradle for all of South Texas, Northeastern Mexico. Um, because from Monterrey, uh, when Jose Escanón found the Via del Norte, the people came from the Nuevo Reino León, which is basically nowadays uh, Nuevo León. So that's why I like to show that book. Uh, basically, it's from the founding families and their descendants. And then more closer to the Rio Grande Valley, I have this book. It's a Borrevia. And it's the early families and their descendants. Basically, I got a census, I got all the families and trying to find their descendants. And that's more connected to South Texas. And I also have similar books for Ciudad Mier. And I also have a baptismal book for uh, Reynosa for those that are interested. And then finally, um, this is one of my book series. This is the Guerra book. And the book series is titled Last Names of Nuevo Leon. Basically, what I'm trying to do is uh, uh, trying to find who was the first Martinez, the first Guerra, the first Rodriguez, uh, the first uh, Benavides to arrive to El Nuevo Reino de Leon back in the early 1600s, uh, middle 15, 1600s, and try and find as many descendants as possible for them and put them into a book. And basically, this all of my books are just tools tools to help you find your ancestors. The theory is that you start doing your family tree, go back as far as possible as you can, and then try and link up to these books. If you're able to link up to these books, well, basically, a lot of the research is already going to be done for you. And also verify what I did by getting the original documents. This will just uh, help you speed up your research. And it's always great to verify what you've been finding with published sources. And right. all of my books are references. They're not books that you're going to open on the first page and go and read it all the way to the end. I've had some people do that, but it's rare. These are just reference books. You're researching something, hey, I have that book, let me go get it and verify what you're researching. Let's, uh, let's say the Monterrey book, uh, that we're talking about the founding families of the third attempt, right, to 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 colonize successfully Monterrey. Um, what does the table of contents look like? Uh, not every piece, I mean, but uh, some of the items. Basically, the table of contents. See, you can see it. It just looks like that. And I'm gonna read you. It says one. It says uh, Diego de Montemayor, and I did include a wife because he married three wives. And I included the descendants of the three wives because um, they ended up in Monterrey. And then for chapter two, we have Diego de Montemayor and Elvira de Renteria Quintanilla. And Diego de Montemayor, I want to say he was uh, the nieto of Diego de Montemayor. And then we have Juan Lopez and Magdalena de Avila. 
Martín de Solís and Francisca Davila. And then it gives you the page number where that particular family starts and where I start listing all the descendants. And what you're going to find in all of my books, after names, after dates, after certain facts, there's a little number. That number, if you go to the back of the book, that's the reference number. Basically, I'm telling you where I got the information from. Now, is everything in my books 100% accurate? No, it's not. And there's no researcher out there that everything is accurate. Unless you have a family tree that's only you and your parents and you have your birth certificate, of course, that's 100% accurate. But other than that, once the further you back you go, there's errors. But that's why I provide a source for everything so researchers could retrace my steps. And I've gotten emails and I welcome those emails. They tell me, hey, Moses, on this page, this doesn't make sense. And I check it and yeah, for sure. It was either a finger problem or I confused the person with another one. But right. they make those and uh, future editions are gonna be more accurate. Right. Um, there's instances where, uh, you know, I'm going to just make up a name, right? Uh, you know, Jesus Villarreal uh, died when he was two years old, but then there's another baby in the same family, you know, another child, Jesus Villarreal, they name him the same. And uh, maybe it did, maybe a middle name, maybe not, uh, you know, sort of to honor that one kid. And so that it leads to confusion sometimes. Sort of. Yeah. And, you know, that happened very often. The first child would die and they, they would recycle the, the name. And... Most of the cases, they don't put a middle name. But you only find out it's a different child because you find two baptismal records and then you find a death record probably a few days later or months later or even a few years later. And then you find another baptismal record, same name, but a later date. And then you find that one of those children got married years later. So you could uh, assume. And, of course, there's no definitive. I had people tell me, well, how do I know this is the... The couple, well, they have the same names, but no, it doesn't say that this is the couple. I'm like, <laughs> a lot of times you're not going to find anything that says that that's a couple. Sometimes you're not even going to find documents where it says that two children are, or two people are brothers and sisters. All you're going to find is that those two people have the names of the same parents. Same rancho, same parents, same time and, frame. And same abuelitos. So you're not yeah. going to find any record that says that they're brother and sister, but guess what? We can deduct, hopefully, you know, because <laughs> there's some people, oh, my God, uh, hopefully you can deduct, hey, well, they have the same parents, the same grandparents, they must be brother and sisters, you know? Um, and that's some of the deductions that we do, but they have to be very well informed with sources. Right. And I, I see instances where uh, some of my ancestors, for example, my, you know, I'm going to just make up something again, but I've seen it several times, you know, let's just say my, you know, great, great, great grandma, you know, that's where I come from. But, but my, but her husband uh, married officially, unofficially, I don't know, but, you know, married a, a second woman, maybe after my great, great grandma passed away. Right. And so there's a different branch, same great grandpa, but, you know, different branch from there, because, of course, in real life, you know, people died young and, and, the, and the, the man remarried or, or vice versa. You know, the, the husband died and, and, the, and your abuelita, you know, great, great, great abuelita, you know, uh, found herself another man and get, had other kids or whatever. So uh, then the, the math gets a little funny, but the, but you make deductions, like you said. Yeah. And, and that's where the software comes in handy because the software will let you visualize all those relationships. Yeah. And some of them even have a relationship calculator that will tell you every possible way that you're related to somebody. Right. And uh, it's frustrating and it's a little bit, uh, uh, you know, it, you have all these helpers out there, like on Ancestry.com, uh, you have a lot of uh, open uh, public trees, family trees, which is helpful to verify and that sort of thing. But then you have, like, people that get maybe a little too overzealous and they, they're like, well... According to the, your records, this lady was 11 years old when she had this, you know, her third kid. Like, hey, you know, something's a little off there, you know. So, um, uh, you know what I found in just a few days ago, and I was like, I think this is a mistake, but no, it, threw, uh, it was a little child. And I say child because she was nine years old when she got married. What are you? And I was like, what? Uh, you know, so now, okay, so all, all those people that I've been, um, 
saying no, it cannot be because they were too young. You never know. You can, yeah. Uh, maybe we gotta re-research those uh, dead ends. Because maybe right. uh, they may be right. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, I mean, Romeo and Juliet. You know, Juliet was thirteen years old. Uh, I mean, you know, back in the day, but still, uh, in the time of the ranchos. I mean, uh, I, I start. I usually kind of go with about 20, 20 years. Well, okay, she maybe sixteen. Okay, that way no. And uh, and again, we we could easily judge people in twenty twenty standards, but. Back in the rancho days, I mean, things moved a little bit faster sometimes, and and the life expectancy, um, in general, was pretty decent. But I mean, penicillin wasn't invented till after World War II. I mean, so uh, it wasn't necessarily that great, especially in the ranchos. Um, yeah, you're right. Before, uh, can I talk about Facebook a little bit? Yeah, please. Of course, we're on Facebook right now, right? <laughs> I don't know. Zuckerberg uh, might, might shut us down. If anybody's out there that's interested in um, doing research and because genealogy can be very lonely and that's the reason that I started uh, genealogy groups on Facebook so we could ne network with each other and I want to talk about the Mexican genealogy that info that's my blog that focuses on uh, Mexico and uh, Daniel that's the perfect place to start with your paternal side we do have a Facebook group for each Mexican state. You know, for Tamaulipas and Nuevo Leon, I've started uh, even Facebook groups for particular cities and towns. But if we're barely getting started, uh, highly recommend go to MexicanGeniality.info, click on community. You're going to see all the Facebook groups that we have. And I don't say that I have because basically it belongs to the community. And we have a, about 100 I'm sorry, we have a close to 50 moderators, I think, uh, taking care of everything. But I highly recommend go sign up to those groups, uh, start asking questions. The only thing that we ask from everybody, be polite, no racial slurs, no bad words, uh, be nice to each other. If you don't have anything nice to say, just don't say it. Because if you say it or you do something wrong, you're going to get banned. That's the only yeah. thing. Because we're trying to build a community of uh, loving, caring people that have a common interest. It's not for politics. It's not for religion. And basically, the only religion we accept there is uh, uh, records, church records. Yeah. Uh, opinions. I, I believe there's other Facebook groups to discuss politics and religion that are very suited. Absolutely. More suited for that purpose. Right. Uh, now, is the Mormon Church? Uh, they have like they're kind of famous for keeping great records as well, right? What's one of their sites that people can go to? Uh, FamilySearch.org. Mm -hmm. It's uh, by the Latter Day Saints, which basically is the Mormons. Uh, but yes, they're basically the I want to say the biggest record holders in the world. They even have a mountain somewhere where they have all their microfilms for safekeeping. Oh yeah, we should put the Latter Day Saints in charge of the census. No, they know everybody. Because they may, they they knock on all the doors. You told. <laughs> Probably right. That way they, they already have the census uh, saved. Also. <laughs> so, uh, question on the uh, comments. Uh, Amy uh, Leal Keller is asking: uh, Any conquistadores uh, related to royalty? And do you know of any who are? This is kind of a tricky question. There's a lot of stuff out there, but it's not verifiable. Uh, I found stuff that says that Marcos Alonso La Garza was a son of uh, Alonso de Estrada, which was the treasurer in New Spain, which I have found no proof for that. Also, they say that Alonso Estrada was the bastard child of the king. Also, no proof. I have found that Alonso Estrada and the king were around third, fourth cousins. Maybe through connections they were raised together, and that's maybe that's why Alonso Estrada used to joke that the king was his uh, uh, his father. Who knows? You know. Um, uh, there's other lines from Nuevo Leon that takes us back to royalty, but some of those lines are also very sketchy, and we don't have the proof. We're basing it on a book that uh, basically the author didn't write any. He just said, "I got." My information from a private archive in Mexico City. Yeah. 
you know what? I, I could make up anything. So I got it from a private active somewhere. And, you know? Right. That's, that's <laughs> what we got to be careful with. Yeah. Now, more than likely, a lot of conquistadores, they had royal blood. Because conquistadores were not just any type of person. Usually these people had squires. They had uh, their weapons, their horses, meaning they came from good-to-do families. And those good-to-do families, you're going to find the genealogies. There's a lot of uh, books that are not copyrighted that were written in the 1300s, 1400s, 1500s in Spain that mention a lot of uh, these other families. Uh, we have a... Uh, uh, what was his name? This was a Sosa. He was the governor of Cuba. I know... Uh, I thought he was one of my ancestors, but again, I tried to do the paperwork and I couldn't find it. But in one of the, those books, it says, Y se fue a la Nueva España. Se, y se casó con so and so. Mm. So we know we have the right person, and then that book connects him to royalty. But again, me linking up to him, it's again, once I, once I tried to do the paperwork, uh, it brought a lot of questions, so I already unlinked them from my tree because I was going by a published source, which once I looked at it more closely, it didn't have any sources to where that information came from. Right. And uh, yourself, how many generations back um, have you gone, or, or what years did you say? More commonly, back to the 1500s. Uh, 1600s, a lot of lines, 1700s, more lines, 1800s, a ton of them. Um, I've traced some one or two lines back to the 1200s, 1100s in Spain. But again, the sources that I have are books, but those books, some of them do say, y esta información vino del uh, testamento de Doña María Suanzo y se encuentra en este pueblito. Yeah. If you think about it, man, that was like 600, 700 years ago. And yeah. What's the name of that town right now? And the, yeah. the, the archive survived. So those are things that we run into. And that's why I like to source all my sources and where I got it from. That way people can question me and we could do better uh, research. Yeah. And uh, I tell people that it's because it's in my book, it's not set in stone. Genealogy is ever, it's ever evolving. Uh, we may find better sources that prove a connection or that disprove a connection. So that's something we're going to be careful, especially the further back you go. Right. Yeah. And I was, you know, kind of stuck here and there and uh, on my mother's side and on maternal side. And, and uh, I had my abuelita and, you know, had told us, you know, several names of her siblings because she had about 13 or 14 or, or she was one of 13 or 14 siblings um so we don't we don't even have all all of those names uh like you said it's important to ask those grandparents when you can but i i, I was kind of stuck a few generations you know here and there and and i finally focused on the maternal side on this one particular lady and uh boy i mean it just opened up because she had married uh i guess a, a sargento you know in the spanish uh army uh and i and i guess suppose i suppose that the 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 tie to the government, right, had had us, I guess, more maybe more records as well, military records and so on, uh, or maybe they just kept better better records on their on their own, you know, soldiers. Who knows? Y pues ese sargento pues no que se casó con este with uh, you know the lieutenant's daughter or whatever, and and so there was these uh, kind of some big wigs and some big names, and uh, one one branch kind of took off to. Jewish ancestors as well, and another branch to uh, to even uh, Moctezuma. And, uh, you know, again, we try our best to verify certain things, but uh, uh, anyway, so it's a, some surprises, you know, like that, like a big, big name, like, oh, yeah, man, wait a minute, you know, and and you, you're diligent and, and you try to double check everything, but, but uh, sometimes you get some surprises like that. And you know, the Moctezumas is probably one of the easiest Native American or, you know, families to trace because they were royalty. And if you had a Moctezuma in your family, you wanted to tell people about it. Um, and I think that's why it's easier to research them. And also because they married uh, uh, with conquistadores. 
Yeah. And then some of those conquistadores made it all the way to our area, which is northeastern Mexico. I know they made it to Zacatecas. Um, and then there's a question about Hernán Cortés. Yeah. Uh, Hernán Cortés, they have some descendants, and actually there's some members of Weird Cousins that claim that they're descendants. Of course, I'm not going to tell them, show me your proof. Or you tell me that you're a descendant of somebody. Yeah, I believe you, you know. Um, but if I'm going to enter you in my database, of course, I need the proof. Um, is that me or you? Um, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm hearing a beep. <laughs> No, it's on your side. Sorry. It's the. It's, I think it's Zuckerberg. He's trying to. <laughs> we're getting too close to the truth. <laughs> you know, it's my, it's my Facebook. Let me just close it. Andale. Este. So, um, yeah, you know, it, it is, uh, you know, it, it's bothersome for some, you know, to have a conquistador again, ancestor. It's it's exciting for others. Uh, you know, it is what it is again. And, and, uh, I mean, he. We know Cortez uh, had several "quote unquote" wives, I guess, in the New World, but no. Um, from what um, I've read, from what I've read, yes. And anybody that wants to learn more about the conquest of Mexico and why things happen and why the Aztecs are no longer in power, I highly recommend you read the book by Bernal Diaz del Castillo. It's called "The True Conquest of uh, New Spain: La Verdadera Conquista de la Nueva España." And you could just Google it and find it on Amazon. It's the viewpoint of a conquistador. And you're going to be able to see how a little band of 300 guys was able to conquer millions of people. And, you know, and honestly, I, I can't understand why people get mad. Oh, the conquistadores and this and that. I'm like, they fought. They lost, you know. It, it was about technology, it was about conquest. And um, and it has happened throughout history and it's still going on right now that basically the strongest is the one that conquers. Thankfully for the Spaniards, they didn't uh, genocide, uh, did genocide on everybody or didn't put everybody in reservations like happened in the United States where they actually tried to do away with the Native Americans. And that's why we. And, and have, there's also the. You know that's why we have uh, a right. thirty percent Native American DNA. That's a reason that we have it. And without right, the because it. Be here. No, it's true. Uh, uh, in 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 more ways than one, the. It's true, and uh, the. I, you know, and it wasn't just the Spaniards alone, right? They they needed the other Native Americans that were against the Aztecs. They needed that support, so it was uh, a group thing. <laughs> yeah, the the ones that helped uh, Cortes were the Tlaxcaltecans. The Tlaxcaltecans. That this is what the Aztecs did. They had a huge empire, and in the middle of the empire, not in the middle, but somewhere in the empire, they had Tlaxcala. They never got rid of the Tlaxcaltecas because they needed somebody to fight with every few years and were to get slaves to sacrifice in the pyramids. Guess what? They were not sacrificing their own people. They were sacrificing Tlaxcaltecans that the Aztecs would go and, and uh, I guess, steal from, from Tlaxcala. So the Tlaxcaltecans saw an opportunity to ally themselves with uh, Cortes to get rid of their enemy. And they they actually did it. And the Tlaxcaltecans uh, had the same rights as Spaniards had. They could ride horses, they could own arms. And Saltillo was founded with 400 families of Tlaxcaltecans. 300 families were taken to San Antonio. And that's why in a lot of people in San Antonio, you see those, uh, uh, face, uh, those facial features of the Tlaxcaltecans because their their descendants are still there. So I mean uh, in you know in human history you're going to have uh, an amalgamation and a mixture uh, travel is going to of course throw some things into the mix and and yes con uh, conquest and war all across the, the globe. Well I want to give you uh, I want to talk real, very briefly if uh, possible about the, our Jewish ancestry for many people in in New Spain in the valley. 
Um, now, are we Jewish? Based on our DNA, we do have Jewish ancestors. Now, do we have Jewish documents? Unfortunately, for Nuevo León, Tamaulipas, and Coahuila, I haven't seen any Jewish records. And I'm going to quote on Israel Cavazos Garza. He was a historian of Nuevo León for 25 years. <clears throat> the historian of the University of Nuevo León for another 25 years, so in total 50 years. And he said, as an archivist, as a researcher, are there Jewish people in Monterrey? He says, no, because the records are not there. But then he says, think about it. If they caught you with one of those records, that meant that they were gonna kill you. So would you keep records? Of course not. And then he says, if you look at our culture, or what we eat, uh, what we do, uh, customs that we do, or words that we say, yes, there's Jewish people in Nuevo León. So those are the two things that you got to see. Basically, it's folk, uh, not folklore, but it's been passed down through generations. Uh, and we do things that are Jewish that we don't even know they're Jewish, but we do them because my, my dad used to do it, my abuelita used to do it, her abuelita used to do it, you know? And maybe a Jewish person will recognize it off the bat. Hey, that's Jewish, but you're like, what are you talking about? You know. So those are the two stances that are out there. Right. I mean, because a lot of folks have the uh, the knowledge or the idea that they or the folklore, like you said, that they're that we have Sephardic, you know, background. But of course, it was dangerous. It was it was uh, <laughs> uh, not 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 safe to say that you were Jewish after the uh, the Inquisition. And which also happened, you know, in 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 Mexico as well. Um, and I want to also give you go ahead and talk about the, your conference that's coming up as we get to, ready to close. Tell us about your conferencia that's coming up. Yes, this year was the uh, each year there's an annual uh, historic on genealogy conference. Well, this year was canceled due to COVID, and I was kind of bummed out. Um, but then. Um, I was talking to a friend through Facebook and she said, hey, we said, well, why don't you make your own? I'm like, well, okay, uh, let me see what we can do. I got a, <laughs> I got a small whiteboard, did two days, right? A two day conference, what it would take. And then guess what? Um, I had to budget how much it was gonna take to pay our speakers. Cause when I go present somewhere, right? Um, I expect at least a little compensation either for gas, food or if you're gonna sleep over, if it's a long travel, at least it pays for the hotel. Um, <clears throat> so basically this year was the first year that we're gonna do the Weird Cousins uh, first annual virtual conference. And even next year, even if COVID is gone and they do the, the annual Texas State uh, Historical Genealogical Conference, I'm still gonna do the Weird Cousins conference because uh, we're providing a conference for a lot of uh, Mexican Americans or Hispanics that live throughout the world and other places, or throughout the United States and other places of the world that don't have access to a conference like this. So that's a major motivator. So we have a total of 17 speakers and they're gonna do a total of 24 presentations. They're gonna be from beginner to advanced uh, uh, levels. Um, and somebody told me, hey, Moses, are these the same presentations that we've seen in the past. I'm like, hold on, this is the first time we're doing it. Of course, these speakers have presented other places. If you've seen them and it's the same presentation, there's nothing I could do about that. But next year, that's gonna be a requirement that they cannot present for us the same topic twice. Um, and hopefully next year, we're gonna be able to pay our presenters a little bit more, that way we, we get more entries and we have a, a bigger pool of presentations to choose from, to either do like a, a theme, choose that. And, um, but uh, if you're interested, uh, go to wacconference.com or go to wearcousins.info and just click on the conference tab and it'll take you to the website. We're doing the regular registration, which is, which is $125. But if, uh, let's say, you and your husband are interested in genealogy, you live in the same household, just buy one registration and both of you are gonna be able to see them. Right, There's and no of course you're saving, you're saving on travel, uh, food and lodging and everything else uh, that you would have gone, if you, instead of going to the physical conference. And again, it's not a money-making scheme for you, you're paying these uh, 
you know, experts from, uh, from where are they from? Uh, They're from all over the place. We had one from Greece, but she's from South Texas, but she was over there. So she submitted her proposal. We recorded it. We recorded several professors from Mexico that would have been available to us other if we were to do it in person. Uh, presenters from California, from Utah, from New Mexico. Uh, had one from Iowa, I think. Um, so the they're from all over the place, the presenters. And that's something we we paid each presenter from 150 to 200 dollars. If they did two presentations, that's 400 dollars, you know. So there's a lot of economics that are going on and a lot of work. And I've gotten emails saying, hey, we says, well, how come you're charging? Well, you know, I have to charge because they're not our presenters are not doing it for free. And it's a three-day event. It's not like a single presentation. And out of those 17 presenters, two of them are doing it for free. One is being sponsored by Family Search. The other one is being sponsored by the uh, Census Bureau. <laughs> so and they're excellent presentations. So I highly recommend anybody that's interested in genealogy um, just to sign up. Yeah, that's fantastic. And we're gonna we're gonna put the links, uh, you know, to some of the, all these links that we've mentioned. Of course, you can you can go to Moises' site, which is scrolling down there. But but we'll put the individual links for the conference and others. And again, yes, it, there is a fee, but uh, you know you're gonna get a lot of bang for the buck. Um, some speakers will speak in English, some in Spanish. No, everything's going to be in English because okay. if, uh, if I look at the uh, statistics and demographics that we have, 98% are English speaking, which is uh, we're targeted to Mexican Americans. Okay. So. I didn't want to do in Spanish because we're going to alienate a lot of uh, English speaking people. Uh, but in the future, you never know. We may do one just in Spanish to target, uh, I guess, uh, more Mexicanos or for a generation of uh, Mexican Americans that are here in the US that English is not their strong suit, but who knows the, uh, um, something, I was gonna mention something else. Oh, if, uh, if anybody wants to know what I'm to, just go to my website, moisesgarza.com and I have links to the conference, links to all my other blogs and even for to the communities to go to Facebook and yeah, in the website scrolling down there, y'all you get and you're gonna see all his books, a ton of books, and and all different links to the, his different sites as well. And uh, well, hopefully next year you'll have you know Coca Cola can be a sponsor and Beanbo. You know we need some uh, <laughs> some more sponsorships. Uh, sounds great. Uh, I hope you. Uh, I wish you very very much luck with the conference coming up in September 23rd, 24th, 25th, and it's uh, through Zoom. Is that right? Yes, uh, I'm still thinking the way to best deliver it, but the, the way it's looking at this moment is going to be through Zoom. But the mem whoever signed up is going to log into our website, and we're going to be live streaming there, and we're going to have the links to Zoom. And it's only for those that want to be able to ask questions, then they open Zoom and be able to use the chat to ask questions. But other than that, if you don't want to ask questions, you just want to see the conference, you could just log in and it'll be live streaming on the website. You right. log in, it's going to be right there. Another thing, if you cannot make it on, make it on September 23rd, 24th, and 25th, sign up. All the recordings are going to be recorded and they're going to be available for 36 days afterwards from September 26th all the way to November the 30th. And that way you could uh, watch them whenever you want. Because I know the conference is going to be on a Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. I know a lot of you are still working, um, so you can make your own schedule or to watch it during those 36 days to watch all of the, the presentations. Right. Now, uh, people from Europe, people from even from Mexico, they're not searching for their ancestors. They're like, no, pues yo soy de aquí. Well, you know, I know where I'm from or whatever. So, uh, but is it an immigrant thing, I guess, that we, we search for our roots? No, I don't think it is. I think it's more you want to know who you are. And guess what? We have a lot of uh, people from Europe that are our primos due to yeah. World War One, World War II. What are so a, lot of, a lot of our servicemen 
they, went, they went and did more stuff than just fight. So we have a lot of cousins in that area over there. That's a great, that's a great point. So, um, and at the end of the day, I mean, you know, we are, we're all, we're all related. I mean, we are part of the human race and yes, we have this, uh, human made idea of quote unquote race, uh, and, and ethnicity and so on. But I mean, at the end of the day, biologically, you know, we all bleed red, right? Um, so we're all somewhat related in that way. Um, uh, I want to give you the last word, Moises, and uh, and we'll and we'll catch you all next time. Well, I want to thank you all for tuning in. Uh, this is one of the first for me to do something live like this, and I want to thank you all for taking the time to listen to what we have to say here. So check out uh, Moises's page, and we'll put some links again on uh, on this video. We'll go back and and uh, type some links for y'all. So take good care and check out some of Moises's books and he does other presentations, other talks uh, as well. So check out his website and just follow him on, on Facebook as well, all those groups that he has. Find your state and, and uh, connect with that way. So bueno, we'll catch you all next time. Take care, everybody. Thank you.